from Copenhagen and welcome to the webinar on floating office Rotterdam. This is presented by Copenhagen Center on Energy Efficiency. My name is Trupti Ergatimad and I'll be the host of today's webinar. Please note that this webinar is part of a district energy webinar series where we invite the winners of the seventh Global District Energy and Climate Awards to present their award-winning work. Just a few highlights before we get started. The webinar is 45 minutes long with time for question and answers at the end. So please use the dedicated icon to send us your questions and we will do our best to answer as many of them as possible at the end. In case you're unable to stay for the entire duration of the webinar, then the recording along with all the materials will be available on our website's knowledge management system in a few days. A few things about the Copenhagen Center. We conduct research and advisory activities in the field of energy efficiency, and we are also the energy efficiency hub for the Sustainable Energy for All initiative. We have a network of global, regional, and national partners who are accelerating the work on energy efficiency, and we also conduct training and webinars on a regular basis. You can find all the previous trainings and webinars hosted by the uh, center on our website's knowledge management system on various topics on energy efficiency, such as district energy, ESCOs, uh, hydrogen, green buildings, etc. And now it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Mr. Albert Takashi Richters. Albert is a partner architect at Powerhouse Company, focusing on concept and vision development with a keen interest in design. He studied architecture at Delft University of Technology and is based in the Netherlands. Albert strongly believes in the importance of maintaining an open dialogue of understanding and communication. So without further ado, Albert, you have the floor. Well, um, first of all, thank you so much for uh, for inviting uh, inviting me and uh, actually also us on behalf of Powerhouse Company. Uh, we're the architecture firm uh, that uh, has designed and uh, built the floating office. Um, and we were asked actually to uh, present how the building got to be um, and uh, uh, how we actually designed it uh, and uh, got it built. Uh, for the Global Center on Adaptation, which is somehow a very similar organization to the one uh, um, uh, to the host organization uh, based in Denmark, but this one is uh, more about adaptation. I'll tell you more about that uh, in the presentation. So I'll, I'll just get started. I just want to give a quick introduction of who we are. Uh, we are Powerhouse Company, an architecture firm based in Rotterdam. Um, a group of around 70 people here um, uh, from all over the world, actually. Uh, we also have some offices in uh, Munich and one in uh, Norway. <clears throat> so we work also uh, um, in different parts of Europe, uh, but also we do projects outside of Europe. So we operate kind of uh, on a global uh, level. Uh, uh, but most of our projects are in the end based in, in the Netherlands since we are um, uh, a Dutch uh, company uh, uh, in its foundation. Uh, we were founded in 2008 by. Um, uh, Nana de Rue, the um, person on the top left, uh, he founded the company and together with a, um, a development company he founded a few years ago, we actually were uh, managed to, to uh, realize the floating office um, for the municipality of Rotterdam and also for the Global Center on Adaptation. We are a company that actually started with a very kind of uh, um, uh, specific uh, and uh, uh, private uh, uh, projects, as you can see here, uh, some villas, uh, and then slowly as the, as the office grew and as we also grew in experience, we started working on urban developments, urban planning, uh, but also um, uh, urban uh, projects uh, in Rotterdam and in Amsterdam here, for instance. Uh, both cities are dealing with um, uh, issues of uh, uh, ho housing shortage and um, they needed to densify and that's why these projects are, are examples of, of, of that um, uh, move. Um, and we also uh, started to work on headquarters for different offices. Um, uh, the Netherlands is kind of a central point for many headquarters in Europe, but also around the world uh, because of its uh, good location uh, and because of its um, good connection to nearby cities like London, Paris. So for instance, ASICS, uh, decided to put a headquarters here for uh, for Europe, um, and we designed their office, which is a highly sustainable uh, office. Um, uh, and in by combining actually our experience from these very private villas uh, uh, with 
the, these newer developments into large scale buildings like offices and, and urban uh, plans. We also managed to also combine them in the sense that we also work uh, on interiors, uh, interior design, so we can uh, allow to, we can give our clients a complete package of what we do. And next to that, we also have these very specific and very special projects, such as um, uh, uh, an antenna uh, uh, tower related, uh, connected to a visitor center in um, Turkey, uh, uh, or uh, a loop uh, building um, as a starting point of a new uh, 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 neighborhood in China, where we combine, let's say, communal functions with sports functions in this uh, also iconic gesture. So we are kind of broad. Um, and at the same time, we also, uh, part of the DNA of our office is that we also really want to get things built. So we don't remain on a conceptual uh, level, uh, on a, just a purely design level, but we really want to build um, uh, and realize our ideas, which also means that in our organization, the, the people you just saw, we have everything from uh, the designers, uh, people that work really in the first stages of, uh, of concepts uh, for the design, all the way up to people that are drafting the drawings that are used then by the contractors to get things built. And we have everything in between, and we work very closely with engineers to actually realize uh, some uh, the ideas we have. And that's something that is not always very common uh, from architecture firms usually uh, in many cases, also the architecture firm is just uh, 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 have um, uh, drafts uh, and engineering companies to do the rest, let's say, if it even comes so far. Um, but we really like to learn how to do all these things. And I think the floating office is one of those projects where we <clears throat> use it as a case study to, uh, yeah, to have a new way of thinking about building, about materials, about sustainability and energy. Um, and this has brought about also uh, a new knowledge about uh, building in timber that you see here, for instance. Uh, uh, this is a visitor center in, um, uh, in The Hague that is made fully out of uh, uh, mass timber. Um, uh, but we also try to find new ways of combining the timber structure with uh, materials on the outside, like uh, natural stone. So this is a university building that had to fit within an existing context of other university buildings with a much more uh, mon um, yeah, monolithic uh, feel. And that's why we have a wooden structure on the inside with the nat natural stone cladding on the outside. So those are sort of innovations where we're also seeking in our design and combining materials that are, are not necessarily a common yet uh, 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 in this new uh, technique with using uh, cross-laminated timber, mass timber, and so on. And here we also have an example of social housing that we're doing with, um, with a fully uh, timber structure uh, with the advantage that we're actually reusing uh, a foundation that was there for a former uh, apartment building that was demolished. Um, and therefore, without having to rebuild the foundation, we're also saving a lot of energy uh, and uh, because timber is lighter, much lighter than concrete or um, uh, or steel. So you can actually re reuse foundations for new buildings. And this is one of those projects where we're exploring that. And it really saves a lot of energy when you don't need to uh, do foundations. Uh, as I was saying, we also, uh, are quite broad in the sense we're also doing urban development and urban planning. So uh, this is uh, actually the location with floating office um, that is uh, uh, going to change uh, dramatically from a harbor to a part of the city. Um, and we've been uh, partnering with the municipality of Rotterdam to think about um, certain areas along the water around the, this harbor uh, uh, in this new development, let's say. And, Actually, the floating office is somehow an extension of that dialogue that we've been having with the municipality. Um, and this is one of those uh, master plans that we have been uh, drawing up uh, uh, for, for one of the areas around this, uh, this harbor area. Uh, as you can see, it's also uh, about renovation. There's some old factory buildings there that are going to be renovated and reused. Um, and all, of course, according to uh, the newest standards in uh, uh, sustainability, uh, material use, and so on, uh, energy efficiency. So just to give you a little uh, um, 
uh, inside of the, the, the context where we're in. Uh, so Rotterdam is a harbor city. It's, uh, it used to be the biggest harbor uh, in, in the world. Uh, of course, now by now, that is not anymore the case. I think we're the, uh, we're, we are ranking somewhere within the top 10, but um, there have been many big harbors uh, developed in, in, in Asia, for instance. Uh, so not no longer the biggest one, but what you do definitely see is that it has had its uh, heritage impact in uh, in Rotterdam, and you see how former harbor areas of Rotterdam have become part of the city. Um, uh, and uh, but before the harbor actually looked much more like this, obviously, um, uh, where it was very clear that the harbor activity took place right next to the living, basically. So life and harbor were kind of intertwined. Uh, and nowadays, these former harbor areas have turned much more into sort of recreational areas, um, and, and, and that harbor activity is uh, no longer part of that uh, city life. Uh, it's not surprising, obviously. This is the, the old center of Rotterdam, um, and so the pictures I've just been showing you are kind of located within this, uh, this uh, area. Uh, but if you look at this area in relation to the, uh, the main center of Rotterdam nowadays, um, it's of course uh, not that big of an area, and if you look at it in relation to the city, uh, the, the bigger city with a huge area, a big neighborhood also in the south of the river, it's actually even smaller. But if you actually look at that area in relation to the borders and the boundaries of the municipality of Rotterdam, then uh, it is a minuscule area because the municipality of Rotterdam includes all the harbor areas that have been stretching out over the years uh, up to 40 kilometers into the North Sea. Uh, so that's all the orange uh, parts that you see. And they are formally all part of the uh, municipality in the city of Rotterdam. So what I'm trying to say with this is that the scale of the harbor has changed dramatically because ships have become bigger and deeper. And therefore, the different waters in the harbors have also changed in size. So. Um, what you see is that the area where we're in now with the floating office, it looks very big when it comes to the human scale, but it's actually very small when it comes to the city scale, let's say. And um, that is kind of now the next chapter in the development of Rotterdam, because we are located in the harbor there with, uh, with, with that is pointed out with the arrow. And so in this context, uh, it's much more about the city that is encroaching onto these former harbor areas. Um, and one of these areas is basically on an axis between the north and the south of uh, the city. Uh, the city has always had struggles with trying to uh, kind of connect the north and the south uh, of the river, um, because the river is obviously an, uh, quite a boundary. Uh, and therefore, they have planned some, some uh, developments along this axis, uh, one of which is around this harbor. And it's within this context that the floating office uh, became an idea uh, in combination with also the fact that the Glo Global Center on Adaptation uh, uh, has its location here. Um, so this is the harbor and it used to be like this. Basically, it used to be basically a sort of parking for barges and, and boats. So it has a kind of a bigger uh, size and less narrow uh, kind of dimensions than the conventional harbors because it needed to store ships somehow. Um, and it was always innovative, actually, from the first uh, from its inception, because it was one of the first electrically driven harbors uh, in the world. Uh, and nowadays, of course, it's a place where huge residential developments are taking place, where the city is really becoming part of uh, this area, and therefore the harbor uh, is becoming part of city life. Um, and this is happening on both north and, and south uh, uh, sides of the, of this water. Uh, and therefore, the municipality has made a plan uh, in which they're going to even reclaim part of that harbor water uh, to create new public spaces, create new ground for new developments, and really make it part of the, the, the city. And what they are trying to apply in this uh, master plan is also the use of very large floating uh, parks. So you see on the north side, um, uh, you see uh, this kind of boulevard, and that would be a floating boulevard. And the same applies for the south. The reason for this is uh, because these harbors are bigger and have been designed for bigger ships. The distance from the land, let's say, to the water 
is very large. And on top of that, it's also changing because we still have uh, we're still dealing with the tidal, the tides in this in this uh, part of uh, of uh, uh, Rotterdam. Uh, so uh, basically, the water fluctuates uh, uh, on average one and a half meter, and therefore it is harder to get people, get public spaces really on the water. Let's say where you can really be in touch with that water, which is so essential actually to Rotterdam's uh, life, uh, city life, and also is very important in terms of bringing back nature into what used to be a heavily industrialized area. Um, so they are exploring floating as a, as a way to bring public spaces and nature back to, uh, to water. And uh, the representation of this master plan you see here in, a, in an artist impression, uh, already with the projection of the floating office, this was a few years ago that this was presented. And parallel to this kind of development, the Global Center on Adaptation was looking for uh, location. Uh, the Global Center on Adaptation was actually founded by uh, uh, Secretary Ban Ki-moon uh, back in 2015 uh, during the Pli uh, Paris Climate uh, Conference uh, in which uh, the UN was working closely with the Dutch government to uh, uh, basically start and initiate an institute that would not only research uh, climate change and how to and, and possibilities and solutions of adaptation to it, uh, but also become a sort of knowledge center and hub for um, organizations and leaders around the world to really uh, set new agendas uh, in order to organize and to implement uh, uh, solutions uh, regarding adaptation around the world. So it also needed its headquarters. Um, they have their sort of research headquarters in uh, in the north of uh, uh, the whole of Holland in Groningen. But they needed their basically their uh, you could say their networking hub uh, in a different location, and they chose Rotterdam uh, basically for the reasons I was explaining above. Uh, Rotterdam, of course, is working on innovation. It's working on, on becoming a livable uh, harbor city instead of a hidden industrial harbor city. Uh, it's also one of the most in, uh, innovative harbors when it comes to smart, uh, tr uh, like smart logistics. Uh, uh, so. In, in that context and in the context of climate adaptation, in the context of, like, say, also the tidal changes, Rotterdam was selected as the place to settle. Uh, Rotterdam, of course, dealing with the scale on the one hand of the harbor, as you can see here quite clearly, uh, and the scale of the city, and also having to deal with how it comes together. So still uh, parts of the river crossing through Rotterdam are quite heavily used in terms of the, its harbor function. But at the same time, the city has to still make use of it in terms of its, uh, 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 you know, to, to create a pleasant life for its citizens, but also to uh, be an adaptable place. We, we still are a country that deals with um, uh, uh, increasingly heavy uh, rain, uh, rainfalls with, uh, with the changing of the climate. And so the river also functions as a buffer for heavy rain and, and so on. And how uh, the way to deal with that is also by adding green, by adding nature, and by making it a more inter integrated system. Uh, so all of this together uh, made for the global center of adaptation, uh, made Rotterdam a good choice to actually settle here. And that's why uh, now we are in uh, this building, basically. So. We ourselves, as Powerhouse Company, we are actually based in the same office building. We are working here, but our upstairs neighbors are the Global Center on Adaptation at the moment. Um, so the design. Uh, well, basically, uh, an important part of this harbor is that uh, it is now closed off by a pedestrian bridge that can open. It's a very important pedestrian bridge because it actually links the north side of the harbor with the south side of the harbor. Um, uh, and both, both areas are in... Yeah, quite some development when it comes to having new residents, new citizens uh, settle here. Um, and uh, But this bridge fortunately can open uh, and the building had to fit in. So this was the first challenge. Um, what we did is we made a foundation, uh, especially for this building. It's uh, It's been poured in concrete. Uh, was not necessarily our first choice of material because concrete usually is quite heavy when it comes to CO2 use. But I'll explain later how we actually managed to use the concrete uh, to our advantage and to really uh, enhance the performance energetically of the of the building. 
Uh, but this foundation has on top of it a very clear grid structure. It's a six by six grid of beams and columns all made out of timber. Uh, and then around those that structure, we, we, we basically placed floors and balconies uh, uh, and obviously the roof to create uh, the basic um, yeah, structure of the design. Uh, and basically all these things together work as, a, as one big system somehow. So um, if you layer the building, uh, you see that the foundation, what we've used in the foundation is a sort of system of uh, plumbing that runs uh, water through the uh, concrete uh, in t with tubes. And this water, of course, uh, absorbs the temperature of the, of the surrounding harbor water uh, and then pumps it throughout the building uh, in order to uh, supply cooling uh, uh, during the hotter uh, months, but also even a base temperature when it gets uh, colder than seven degrees. So in the winter time, sometimes we reach minus uh, minus ten, not that much, but occasionally we do. Uh, but generally we are around uh, zero degrees, and then it's always good to have the water as a base temperature because it will always be at least seven degrees in this in this part of Holland. Um, and so that is also even a base temperature. And then we have uh, the timber structure uh, that is, of course, um, because it's made out of timber, it's a huge storage of CO2. Uh, I'll, I'll show you in a bit how much that, uh, that means. Um, and then on top, we have this roof, this pitch roof. Uh, the pitch is actually not only an aesthetic choice, but it's very much a functional choice because we, with the pitch roof, we managed to angle the solar panels on the south side. Uh, ideally for the sun, uh, and therefore we managed to uh, to supply all energy that is needed in the building and uh, for the building, uh, even for the pumping of the fluid for the for the cooling and the heating, uh, the climate uh, uh, installations um, uh, we all provided from the solar panel. So it's a completely integrated system, and I think the building would never perform if all these sort of pragmatic uh, 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 techniques. Uh, or a pragmatic set of techniques uh, would not come together in, in a sort of optimal way. Uh, on top of that, we work with this grid, as I mentioned, and this grid allows for very, a lot of flexibility. So that means that you can prolong the life of the building uh, to uh, perform uh, well throughout uh, uh, at least half a century, even longer, uh, uh, if it's maintained properly and maintenance is kept low because we use uh, um, very uh, yeah uh, low maintenance uh, materials as well uh, by for instance the treating uh, of the wood panels on the outside but on top of that it the, the 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 life of the building is prolonged because of its flexibility so for instance in the plans you can already see that we deal with different functions so we have a restaurant uh, on the lower floor, uh, we have office functions. You can see also how we can introduce walls, or if you come to our uh, our floor, this is our office floor where we choose to have much more open interactions since we're working on our designs and we need to feed off each other's creativity. We have an open floor where you hardly have any walls. Uh, and then on the top floor, the global center on adaptation, again, needs more areas where they can uh, 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 sit privately or have meetings, and then you have again a more cellular structure. So this allows for flexibility, and on top of that, the six by six grid also allows for uh, not only uh, office functions, but you can imagine housing uh, 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 as well within this this structure. So that flexibility is extremely important to prolong the life uh, the lifespan. Uh, when it comes to design. Um, the main challenge of floating, of course, is balance. Uh, if you do not have a symmetric design, <laughs> uh, basically you will start, uh, the, the building will not uh, float horizontally unless you add ballast. But of course, when it comes to uh, minimizing materials uh, and energy and transport, you want to minimize the amount of extra weight you're using for the building. And therefore, ballast is not really a good thing. And that's why the starting point when we, we started the design was to make a very clear and symmetric design in order to have already a good basis upon which to well, literally float. Uh, so it's symmetrical, also in both directions. 
Uh, and obviously, as architects, symmetry is always a very good tool to make something look elegant and representative. And we use this, of course, as well, uh, since in the end it is uh, uh, the, the house of the global sense on adaptation, uh, for which uh, very important meetings have to be held with uh, all kind of uh, visitors from all over the world, uh, sometimes quite important ones as well. What I just explained in this uh, previous diagram, you can see here again in the sections, we have basically all our climate units are half underwater in the, in the floating foundation. Uh, you see indicated in the blue and the red circles underneath this, uh, this tubing system. Uh, but what you also see here more clearly is balconies. So the balconies not only help provide outdoor spaces right outside of your office floor, but they also have the function, of course, uh, as passive um, uh, shading for the hotter uh, periods of the year, where they work uh, to keep the sunlight, the really hot sunlight, out of the building, which of course helps in the performance and the energy consumption of the building. Uh, at the same time, when you need that sun to come in and when you actually would like to have that warmth in, uh, in a uh, colder month, the sun is lower and therefore is able to pass under the uh, the balcony. So we've been thinking about balancing all these aspects uh, into the building so that we can create not only a pleasant and elegant environment to work in, but also very much a highly perform, uh, like a high uh, performance um, uh, project, let's say. And this is then how it translate, uh, tra translates actually into the design where, you know, since we feel that Timber is the hero of the building. We've shown the structure. We've actually accentuated this structure uh, in the design to make it very present uh, as an element, as a feature, that it's really clearly a, a wooden uh, structure. Mind you, wood is also, of course, a very great material to float because, again, uh, as I mentioned in our previous project about this uh, apartment uh, in, in Rotterdam, it's lightweight. So also that helps a lot with uh, uh, with building on wall. And here you see a few images of uh, building and, and how the different elements matter. So we use this very, because we have a grid system, we have a very modular uh, system in a way. So modular in the sense that columns and beams and even uh, parts of the facade are very re repetitive. Uh, and because it's uh, all made prefabricated in the factory, it can be built very fast. The building was actually uh, made water like from the starting start of the building to actually moving in. It took eight months, basically, which is extremely fast. And that's because everything is prefabricated. Uh, and on top of that, everything is done through computer te technology. So the precision that we needed in order to be able to machine and engineer all these elements uh, was only uh, possible through uh, computer aided design. Uh, and that allows for high precision and also high speed of building, basically. Um, and here, basically, I show a diagram showing the advantages of timber because we always see we always say timber is a sustainable material, but we actually never really, it's not often explained why exactly that's the case. So first of all, you know, uh, timber is a storage of CO2. Um, it's it's actually it's 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 solar power, but then stored in 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 trees, obviously. But besides that, of course, as a building material, it's extremely advantageous because uh, in our case, for instance, we made a building that you can actually screw apart, almost like an IKEA furniture, for which you can reuse the elements, like the columns, the beams, you can basically repurpose them as they are. Uh, but obviously, after a long time, uh, they might lose their structural integrity. But that doesn't mean that it's the end of the life of the material because then you can still grind it down. Uh, you can still uh, reuse it, for instance, in all kind of composites, uh, in paneling that you can then reuse again in buildings uh, or in surfaces for, for instance, uh, cladding or facades. Um, and then even after that, you can you can do this a couple of times. So it, it also goes through multiple cycles of circularity above, uh, apart from being an uh, CO2 storage. Uh, and that makes it much more different than, for instance, steel or concrete. Steel costs a huge amount of energy to repurpose, let's say. Of course, it's sort of endlessly recyclable. But the amount of heat you need to kind of uh, melt the steel into new new materials is 
very uh, is very very uh, uh, taxing on the environment, and obviously concrete com is not really reusable. It's not really circular. Um, it's circular to the extent that maybe you can use it again in roads, uh, uh, but not really uh, in a without basically adding an, a lot of extra energy into the system in order to reuse it. Let's say wood has the advantage of doing that. Uh, and so we designed a building that is basically made out of so many repetitive components that, as I said, you can easily take it apart. Uh, but also, all these uh, all these materials and 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 parts are easily uh, kind of like machined. And because they are so rep repetitive, it also helps in the building process because you can create a sort of standard package of uh, uh, of materials and elements. Uh, and this is one of the diagrams that shows the main kind of knot that you see throughout the building of all the columns and beams coming together. And then when you combine it with these uh, these systems of solar panels and the tubing in the in the floating foundation in order to cool and heat the building, uh, you get a basically without necessarily using the newest in, uh, of technologies. It's it's really about balancing all these technologies together. Uh, in a very pragmatic way to get the most out of it. So that's why, uh, I mean, we we the deadline for building it was so tight that we weren't we didn't have uh, a lot of uh, room to explore new techniques. We really had to build through existing technologies, proven technologies. Of course, the best of of the current technologies, uh, and combine them in a way that would work uh, extremely well. Uh, and then in the end, we decided, we made a building that is not only technologically advanced, but also pleasant to work in. Uh, because for us also, thinking about working and where we work and our workplace is also extremely vital to uh, to 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 our practice as architects. Because in the end, uh, as we all know, uh, working is, we spend the majority of the time in offices, let's say. Uh, uh, I want to show a quick video uh, of actually uh, how this foundation came to be. I'll be talking over it to explain a few things that we see, and I will just jump into the video uh, through the YouTube link that I've been sent, um, and I'll start it up. So what you see here is one box that is then being brought to Zandam, which is the city near Amsterdam. And there it is connected actually to 14 other boxes. Uh, and that, uh, all these boxes are being anchored together to make this gigantic floor that you see here, which was then uh, tugged all the way from, uh, well, from near Amsterdam to Rotterdam. And then on top of this, from the, basically from the side of the water, uh, with quite small cranes because what is light uh, the building could be built on top of the it's interesting to know that also the building process ha has to happen symmetrically because if you start building on one side then again you can uh, create this balance so the building was built from the middle to the outside and here you see for instance also big glass uh, windows you see also the precision that we can when building with machine wood. And also how the thickness of the floors is quite small. So it reduces material use. Uh, yeah, and basically this is the end result. So you see a building that is uh, on the one hand, uh, um, uh, I mean, it, it has a sort of representative presence. Uh, by the way, in the foreground, you see this sort of island uh, connected with a bridge. And this is actually the first piece already of the, the project of the municipality that I was talking about with these floating boulevards. Uh, they, are, they already made a, a, the first piece um, just to kind of test test how to build it. And then they will they will build consecutive pieces, segments of this floating boulevard in the coming uh, two years, um, if I'm correct. Uh, but the reason I'm mentioning it is because the floating office was built first and uh, it allowed for it also to be a pilot to understand how we build these very large scale floating uh, um, uh, foundations, basically, 
And that technique has then been used again by the municipality to make these floating boulevards. So already actually uh, quite quite immediately after the floating office was getting uh, built, uh, the the municipality also felt quite uh, confident to apply the same technique for these boulevards, which in the end will be uh, uh, fully vegetated with trees, even like like large large trees growing in them. Um, so this is the first part of that. You see a building with a lot of glass, and here you see kind of the minimal detail detailing that we applied um, uh, with the balconies around. Uh, we also have. Uh, openings in in the walls that are sort of hidden away uh, to keep for a uh, elegant design. Um, uh, we have the green roof on the one hand. You see also these large glass surfaces. Of course, it helps us to bring light in, uh, and and definitely being on water, the water also reflects light into the building. So it's an amazing experience actually to be working inside a space like this with uninterrupted views. Uh, we have 55 of these uh, panes of glass, three by six meters, uh, triple glazing, of course, to main, make sure that our, our climate is uh, is kept uh, well controlled on the inside. Um, uh, but it, it it's really enhances basically the experience of the building as not only um, an elegant place, but also uh, a comfortable place to work in uh, for everybody that is uh, uh, using it. Uh, well, some nice pictures uh, of the proud moment of the opening. Uh, Ban Ki-moon himself was here together even with our, our king. Uh, so that's always a moment of, uh, of pride for us that uh, I always like to show. Uh, but at the same time, even though it's a very formal building, as you can see from these images, it's also very a building where, you know, together with, uh, with, with our colleagues and also our neighbors from the Global Center on Adaptation, we can make use of the spaces outside the building uh, uh, to have uh, uh, some rest, um, uh, keep our minds fresh, uh, um, have some uh, fresh air, um, uh, and enjoy basically kind of like an environment, uh, a healthy working environment that, of course, helps us with what we do uh, in our work, let's say. Um, so it's also a place where uh, life takes place uh, together with, uh, uh, yeah, with the co-workers, um, uh, throughout the seasons, uh, and that's, as I said, is extremely important for us um, as well. Uh, here, then, some images of the interior. Uh, we, as I said, we also do interior design, so it was very nice to work on our own interior and to work also on the interior of the Global Center on Adaptation, where we really used circular materials uh, for fi the finishings. And here you see how the transparency works here. Actually, we're standing outside, but then looking through an office and then looking back out again. Um, and here's the last video, actually, basically to kind of show the philosophy of ourselves as an office, but also how the office kind of now is uh, and how it works. It's a bit of a more artistic uh, video, but still, I think, nice to nice to show. So. Remco has once said that Rotterdam is the least pretentious city of the Netherlands. That was actually a very smart and accurate observation. The fact that we have redefined the city for so many decades also means that there's a certain relaxedness and there's no pretense, you know. We don't need to pretend to be more than we are in Rotterdam. And as a designer, that's great because you have the feeling that there's openness and freedom here. The voting office was basically initiated by the municipality of Rotterdam. They had actually managed to get the global center on adaptation to, to come to Rotterdam. And they promised them a floating office. We said, okay, well, you know what, we can take care of that for you. So we designed it, but we also developed it. And I think it's a beautiful gesture for the global center on adaptation to be actually in a floating office. And we're going up and down two meters every day and show that architecture can be totally adaptable to changing climate.
just to just to close, I want to say actually, I mean, as as you can see in the video, um, for us aesthetics are an important thing, uh, and uh, some people think that that's just a kind of a very super superficial thing to say, but I think uh, sustainability is often talked about in terms of technical issues and technical challenges, and we think that we can actually achieve innovation by combining the technical challenge with with beauty somehow. Uh, in the end, beauty is one of those vehicles that can engage people, that can attract people, that can really invite people to see a, a new possible future. And, and that's kind of who we are as a, as a company. Uh, but indeed, there are some facts to be mentioned regarding the office. These are some facts, uh, for instance, we have, I mean, the floor, the floor surface uh, of the building is quite big. We have uh, a total of 3,600 uh, square meters which is, of course, a quite, quite a big uh, surface. It's in the end, the large, largest floating office in the world. Um, and we actually produce more energy than we need. Um, this is, funny enough, a fact sheet that we made predicting our energy use before we were here for one year. Uh, but um, a few months ago, we actually were here for one year and we could redo the calculations on the energy efficiency. And wait, basically, the energy efficiency actually uh, turned out to be even higher than we expected. So we are now uh, uh, producing 41% more than what we need in the building. And this energy is something that we are uh, bringing back to the city's grid. We are connected to the municipal grid uh, and we can supply the municipality with energy, uh, for instance. Uh, secondly, uh, we, of course, uh, are an enormous uh, store, store of CO2. So there's... Uh, 1.6 uh, uh, cubic uh, um, meters of, uh, uh, or let's say uh, 1,440 tons of uh, CO2 that is stored within the wood. And that basically equals, uh, when you look at the average car nowadays, it equals uh, 10 million driven kilometers. So that's quite a big uh, storage of, of, of um, uh, CO2. And an, an interesting fact actually about this wood is that uh, when you count all the forests in Europe that are actually uh, made for uh, production of wood, for, for, for instance, uh, building, uh, but also other building materials, the, um, uh, you know, as we speak, all the forests are growing, little branches are growing, leaves are growing, uh, and the wood that we need, the, the kind of um, uh, mass, the, the mass of timber that we need, for the building actually grows back within 15 minutes, surprisingly enough. I think 15 minutes was even the conservative number that was uh, given to us by our uh, uh, wood suppliers. So it's kind of surprising actually that um, the source, the amount of wood is not really the issue. It's actually how you get it to the right location and how you, uh, um, how you uh, basically convert it to the right building materials. But it's a it's a, it's a, an amazing source of materials that we can uh, produce actually, uh, and it's actually all solar energy. I mean, forests grow through the sun, so um, actually the solar energy is what makes the wood. And with that, I would like to close. Um, I think I went a little bit over time, as you can hear. I can talk uh, long enough about this, but I, I'm sure you also have some questions to ask. So I, I think I'll give the floor back to um, to Trufti. I'll uh, switch off my presentation and then uh, I'm happy to know uh, what the questions are. Thank you for that fantastic presentation uh, Albert uh, it's a truly incredible feat to see and now it's time for the question and answers. The first question we have is is the stability of the building affected by the number of people and their movement within the building? Yeah, uh, well, that's a. Uh, it's funny that almost everybody asked that asked that question. Uh, I, it makes sense, obviously, but since uh, people are are heavy and, of course, uh, experience on boats uh, make for that experience. But as I said, this is an extremely large building. It's a very heavy building as well. So um, and uh, yeah, we as as let, let's say our mass as people is very very small in relation to the weight of the building so you will not notice it actually you do notice it in, in certain things like um, the solar panels on the one on the southern side of the roof are lighter than the um, the green roof on the other side so we are counterbalancing it with um, I think in some of the photos you saw the steps going down to the water these steps are not on all sides they are positioned only on the south side actually as a counterweight to the roof uh, 
And these elements, yeah, we have many of these sort of like smaller uh, kind of uh, design elements that are supposed to keep the building balanced somehow. Thank you, Albert. Uh, the next question we have is, uh, there has, has there been an analysis on the rising water temperatures in the harbor due to climate change and their impact on the performance of the cooling system? Uh, that's a pretty yeah that's a that's a that's a good question actually um uh well i would say the impact when it comes to the cooling system uh, the advantage of being in the water throughout the year is that okay maybe if the if the temperature rises it may may be less beneficial for the cooling but in the end in the winter it is more beneficial for the heating so from that point of view it kind of evens equals its side out uh, but that being said, there have been, uh, I mean, the harbor itself and the city of Rotterdam, they have measuring points around the, the harbor. And it is actually true that the, the temperature of the water is rising. So it is also quite noticeable um, in terms of the, the, the kinds of fish that are now found in the harbor. Uh, funny enough, um, fishermen are very happy at the moment here. They even there are some some people living in the city that come to fish in the harbor and find fish here that were that you wouldn't find before. So, on the one hand, they are happy, but of course, it also is a quite a, a, a yeah quite an indication that that climate change is is something that is very close to us. Actually, it's happening underneath us at the moment. In fact, <laughs> yeah. Yes, thank you. Uh, and the next question is sort of a follow up to what you just said, because uh, you they want to know about uh, how the environment and the biodiversity has been impacted. So you did mention about uh, how the rising temperature has been, yeah, attracting more fish in the harbor. But uh, can you think of anything that has been directly impacted by the building itself in the harbor? Uh, you mean if the building has an impact on on the harbor in any way? Um, well, not, not that I know. I mean, obviously there is always going to be some impact when it comes to, uh, I mean, let's say the, the, the heat we produce as, as a building, um, uh, always is something that we need to keep into account. But of course we, we made a building where let's say the temperature is controlled so well, uh, as you could see, the, the big windows are not openable. Uh, that is a deliberate decision we made. Um, to keep the building in a way airtight in order to keep the energy inside. So any energy that go back into the harbor would be a loss of energy. And we have tried to um, avoid that as much as possible. Uh, you do see an impact when it comes to biodiversity, even though it's a very small impact, I would say. I mean, it's not a meaningful impact for the city. Uh, but what you do see is that because we have a big green roof and because we have our sort of green areas around the, 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 the building, uh, you see all kinds of birds living here, like from swans to geese. Uh, uh, it's it's quite fun. I mean, it also means we need to clean the deck a lot. <laughs> um, uh, but we do we do have many more kind of like uh, uh, animals around us, which is very nice, and it's very 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 nice to see uh, as well. Also, thank you. And we have another question that we just got. Uh, what was the partnering between the municipality authorities, private companies, and the universities in order to make this project possible? Uh, and what were the most important milestones? Oh, yeah, that's that's kind of a bunch of things at the same time. So, so basically, um, as I mentioned, and the the narrator of the video is actually the founder of uh, Powerhouse Company, Nana de Rue. Um, he's the one that was the voiceover in that last video. Uh, so he also founded a development company, uh, actually because he wanted to be able to control the, the building process much, much more. Um, often developers, you know, they're only thinking about their yields and their costs, and therefore there's a lot of cuts that are being made in the process that doesn't necessarily benefit the quality and the end quality of the building. And so he founded a development company in order to have more control of that, in order to be able to deliver high quality um, uh, architecture, let's say. Uh, because in that, by being able to control that process, it doesn't necessarily mean that you are cutting less or cutting, uh, that you're not cutting costs, but it's more about managing the process better. So that's one thing. The other thing is uh, we have been working already a lot with the municipality in this area, uh, First of all, before we started on the floating office, as I mentioned in my introduction, um, uh, and because they had experienced 
our way of work and the the speed at which we could work and the, so the fact that we always uh, could uh, relate it very quickly to uh, the you could say the spreadsheets uh, the financial spreadsheets of the developer being the developer right uh, since the developer is kind of basically the the, the, the right next to us uh, we actually share the same floor in the office so we also have very quick communication the municipality felt very confident that we were a good um, we were a good team to work with let's say uh, because in the end um, I made the first the very first sketch and it sounds kind of idyllic but I actually made a little sketch on paper for the floating office that was back in uh, sept end of September 2019 um, and we moved in uh, we moved in April 2021, basically. Uh, so that's one and a half year after the first sketch was made. We basically moved in. So that speed was essential. And also it was essential to uh, for the Global Center on Adaptation who had to open the building for a climate conference that was organized, like a European climate conference that was organized in Rotterdam around that time. Um, uh, so you know there was there was different needs. There was of course the promise from the municipality, global sanitation would be here and get get a representative office. So uh, in that sense, we didn't have to go through a, a long bureaucratic process because the municipality already had that wish and already had kind of uh, set the the the, uh, the foundations, let's say, on paper for this project to get built. Uh, the thing that needed to be organized was financing and uh, and 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 basically the design. But since we were connected with the with the red company, the development company, that could be organized very fast as well. So that's kind of how how it works or how it worked. And in terms of milestones, um, uh, yeah, I mean, um, of course it. Yeah, I don't know if we don't really work in 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 the sense of miles. I I mean, apart from the fact that it got built very fast, of course, uh, the, uh, uh, getting the floating foundation finished that was kind of a milestone. I mean, we we, we don't build float. This is our first time we build on a floating uh, foundation. Uh, and then the other milestone is getting it here to Rotterdam from Amsterdam. It took around a day in the end. So I mean, in the end, the whole water network in Holland is so is so uh, uh, um, yeah so spread that you can really uh, transport anything through water and uh, this took uh, around half a day to get this whole foundation it is a foundation of uh, 24 meters uh, wide and um, uh, seven, uh, 90 meters long uh, it took a day to get it here and the milestone I think was that it just fit through the bridge I think we had a margin of around 40 centimeters uh, to get it through this bridge that I showed in the in the presentation, uh, so yeah, you could call that a milestone. And then obviously moving in was the next one. And uh, we have time for one final question. I think, um, what were the strategies to manage the humans and organizations of this technology to cope with the cap capabilities needed to get the goal of its implementation? Well, I think I touched upon it a, a little bit in my previous answer. Um, so first of all, I think. What is important is 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 a kind of a very clear and 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 fast communication. Uh, uh, it it has to be a very collaborative thing. Uh, so, um, uh, of course, the 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 municipality on the one hand is our client together with the developer, but at the same time, if you work with them as if they are team members rather than clients, uh, it it makes for a much more uh faster communication i think so i think that's somehow essential definitely in this project mm. secondly also it's important to understand uh yeah really very stay very very focused on which ambitions need to be met uh and what are what are the most effective ways to meet those ambitions so somehow in a funny way like often sustainability sustainable projects they want to really exhibit the fact that they're sustainable so you see windmills or you see kind of like new uh, new innovations and um but that doesn't mean that it's first of all it doesn't mean that it's the best technology and second of all it also usually means that it's difficult to apply uh and that means that then you know you have to do a lot of problem solving in order to get those technologies to actually work um 
I mean, we just didn't have that space in terms of time. But at the same time, I do believe that also, even if we would have the time, this was a very good way of managing the process because you're, and on the one hand, you're meeting the ambitions. You are, you are in the end making a representative building, something that uh, the city can be proud of, something that the global center can be proud of. Uh, but still doing it with a, a level of rationality and pragmatism that allows for uh, a good speed of building efficiency, but also the meeting of these ambitions and in the end, uh, the realizing of a, of, of, of a very nice uh, place to work somehow. I would say that would be my answer, sort of, but uh, yeah, I'm just a designer in the end, so. <laughs> No, but uh, thank you so much for your responses, Albert. I mean, it was truly great to get your insights on the on this incredible project. And we would like to thank you for uh, taking time off from your busy schedule to be part of this webinar. Uh, and now we have reached the end. So I would like to thank you again. And I would also like to thank the audience for their active participation. And please note that this webinar is part of a series. So please uh, sign up to our newsletter on our website to uh, keep track of all the webinars and trainings that we'll be hosting in the future. So once again, thank you everyone and have a great day.